next, we now um, yes switch to the northern end of Europe, may, uh, namely Finland. And the topic we'll focus on is uh, the human-machine interaction, in my own words, or as um, Professor Thomas Olsen would put it, um, human technology interaction design, because he specializes in social technology, socio-technical terms, and computer-supported cooperative work, and um, does so as an associate professor uh, of human-centric design at Tampere University in Finland. And um, he's really going to have a look at how we can uh, use IT on a sustainable, um, in a sustainable fashion, really, to enhance human life. As we've already discussed yesterday at the EdTech um, bit of the, of the festival already, somehow it needs to be in the background, the technology. It should not be center stage. It should not be this shiny new object that we focus on and get carried away by its buzzwordiness. But ideally, it is just in the background, as is a physical space you're sitting in, but you're actually really focusing on the content and the humans. So. How we could do so, he'll share in some hopefully very fascinating and, as he promised, provocative examples. I'm very glad to have you on the call, Thomas. Thomas, 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 so it shouldn't be a problem on this side. No, no, we can no, 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 no. Oh. I, th I just, yes, hang on, on give, give us, us a couple of seconds to figure it out. Um, Thomas, I think you can hear us. Um, just make sure that tab where you have the conference page open is muted and the Zoom channel is open, then we don't have the interference. Uh, well, the stage is yours, and I'll join you back in the last five minutes for a Q&A. And thank you for this lovely opportunity to talk to you all. And indeed, uh, greetings from Finland. I'm in the city of Tampere. And um, probably many of you do not know the city too well, so I could just briefly summarize that Tampere is like the Berlin of Finland. I mean, both cities have a vibrant culture and also a lot of interesting old post-industrial locations. So kind of being here is perhaps closest possible for me to being there in Berlin in person. Uh, as said in this talk, I, will, uh, I want to share the story of our research group from the, from the past eight years or so. We've been interested in the cross-section of information and communication technology and the social nature and behavior of us humans. Uh, I'm afraid that the talk will be shamelessly very self-centered, so I'm mainly talking about our own work, and I even entitled the talk according to the name of the research group we have. But the, but the point of doing so is really to hopefully inspire some new thinking about the technological futures that we as the humankind envision. And just like the title provokes, are we developing technology for or against our social nature? And is it built with respect to or despite of our social needs? So the talk is not directly about the conference main theme, uh, education, but I believe that many of the ideas I share could be applied also in the context of education. Um, moving on to this next slide, let's see if I work, if it works. Here we go. So a key starting point for this talk is, is the body of social scientific research related to information and communication technology. And many of our current tools and platforms, they are problematic and paradoxical, to say the least. For example, despite having numerous communication apps and services, more and more people are feeling lonely and disconnected from the surrounding society. So computer-mediated communication, such as social media services, chat applications, and so on, they have, of course, allowed a lot of new forms of social interplay with remote others. However, the kind of the mediated nature of interaction, it has also resulted in various unexpected behavioral consequences, such as hate speech, uncivility in online discussions, and this kind of vanification and superficiality of social interactions. 
let alone the effects on social polarization. So a kind of a somewhat conservative argument could criticize the pace at which new technologies are introduced and then integrated into the social fabric of our lives. The pace alone calls for reflection and consideration of alternative futures. So against this quite, quite a critical background, I would summarize that our work addresses two underlying lying aims. So firstly, we want to understand how technology influences our social lives, how it kind of affords certain forms of interaction, maybe better than some, than some other forms, and uh, how it sets new conditions and restrictions to our social behavior. And secondly, and maybe more importantly for this talk, we use all this insight to, to design new technologies with an intention to enhance human sociality in general. For example, to improve collaboration, to facilitate the birth of new social ties and so on. I will soon give some examples of, of the kind of speculative designs we have created. Uh, we've been approaching these questions in different con contexts, ranging from work life to leisure and from computer mediated interactions to more like collocated face to face interactions. Uh, but first, a quick word just about the research approach. So in order to make a practical impact on these kind of topics, we need both a speculative problem solving mindset on the one hand and a kind of a critical voice on the other. And research through design is this kind of an interdisciplinary approach for doing research uh, that does exactly that, this by, by focusing on the generative yet critical function of improving the world by making new things, things that could transform, disrupt, enhance, or otherwise change the current state of the world. And this then makes it possible to explore imaginaries of alternative speculative futures, just as outlined, outlined in this quite famous figure about the futures cone. And then this allows the study of what, which of these alternatives might be preferable for, for people. Um, let's jump to the more specific examples and topics we've been covering. So the first area of issues which we were dealing, uh, dealing with roughly from 2013 to 2017, it concerns how the use of personal devices tends to isolate people from the surrounding others. So situations such as these on the pictures, they are probably very familiar to us all, especially in public places. And this issue of kind of social bubbles has also been discussed in public media for over a decade already. And this kind of isolating behavior is partly explained by civil so-called civil inattention, which Irving Goffman already, the sociologist, coined already in the 70s. But people tend to form these kind of technological cocoons or bubbles around themselves also when in the company of familiar people. And our, I would say that our personal devices play a very significant role in why that happens. And this aspect has been thoroughly discussed in many books, such as Sherry, Sherry Turkle's book, Alone Together. So basically, the, our constant connectivity with the remote people and our presence, presence on the various digital platforms it tends to disrupt the interactions with those who are close by, right? So in other words, the devices that are meant for improved connectivity have also become devices of isolation. And then to address this issue, we have followed a somewhat nostalgic or maybe a romantic approach of aiming to invite face-to-face -face interaction between people, between nearby people, bo both familiar people and strangers. And funnily, I, would, I could say that what we have basically done is to kind of come up with new technological solutions to an issue that was caused by the previous technologies. Uh, let's give some examples. Here's a first speculative design uh, example called social display. It's an idea of having a secondary display at the backside of a mobile device, 
And here's an image of a somewhat maybe awkward, yet fully, fun fu fully functional prototype of, the, of this concept. And its sole purpose is to provide a simple visual cue about the user's current activity. In this case, it shows the name and logo of the application currently active. Basically, the display kind of invites nearby others to perhaps comment or somehow take part in the, in the user's activity. For example, if we think about that, let's say a family gathering around the dinner table or a school class uh, having a break, this kind of secondary display could maybe offer tickets to talk so to those in close proximity. So tickets to talk re refers to this kind of good reasons to interrupt with something that is timely and relevant in that situation. And maybe a more speculative scenario would be in the same in public places or let's say large campus areas where the display could then enable this kind of chance encounters with nearby strangers. So for example, somebody uh, who notices that you have a shared interest in a specific uh, game or whatever application is, sh is shown on the display. Now the point and the provocative question here is whether, whether we are ready to compromise some of the privacy to provide better transparency and social approachability. So in other words, how could the personal and private nature of our smart devices not be away from the sense of being together? Here's another concept. This time it's related to photography. And as we all know, taking photos has become increasingly fast and easy over the last few decades. But at the same time, the social value and the memorability of the recorded situations might actually reduce due to the very individualistic nature of the act of taking photos. So we have this co-cam concept, co-camera concept, which basically aims to enforce cooperation. It forces people to cooperate. So it turns photography into a joint activity. The other user can only press the shutter button while the other user can only adjust the kind of the direction of the viewfinder. So the users are basically indirectly forced to plan and, and coordinate the activity together. And based on a user study that we ran, the, the photos taken with the co-cam, they were said to feel more memorable and, and rich in meaning. And each picture, uh, although it required more effort, uh, time and decision making, but it also con contributed very positively to the perceived value of these photos. And if I try, try to make a weak connection to the theme of education also here, perhaps such examples of enforced co cooperation could help also students to work and learn together, even in very simple tasks such, such as photography. And a third example, a, a mobile application called Next to You. It's based on the idea of hyperlocal relations. So hyperlocal relations such as those in a neighborhood or, or in school campuses. So the idea is, is to encourage interaction between people who are regularly within close proximity to each other, but people who don't necessarily know each other very well. So again, thinking about the university campus, you, might, you have a lot of these people you, you encounter who have become this kind of familiar strangers, or, or they are these kind of weak ties that it might be beneficial to develop into stronger ties. So in this application, the user has a profile and by being close to the others, simply like that, you collect bits of profile information about the other, other users. So it's kind of like a hyperlocal Twitter where your profile and posts, they are um, shared with only those who have been in close proximity to you. And the more often two people encounter, the more often or the more is kind of automatically shared by the application. So the profile information kind of accumulates through every encounter then, and, and over time it forms a very interesting collection of people and, and different details about them. Now the provocation here is basically asking that can such very lightweight mediated interaction also spark off 
face-to-face -face encounters and interactions. And finally, if you allow me to linger on the on the topic of pandemic here, uh, I think this kind of a hyperlocality became really essential during the last one and a half years, because personally, I feel that in the middle of the lockdown, I noticed that much of my social connections were the other dog owners who I met in our neighborhood while walk walking our dogs, rather than my long-term friends or colleagues, for example. So it would have been very interesting to have something like, like this kind of an application to, to maybe trigger discussion between the dog owners. Uh, okay, running to the next topic. So the next issue we have been focusing on roughly from 2017 to 2020, it considers work life and collaboration. So in particular, we've been uh, thinking about the question of who. So with whom could collaboration be most fruitful? So literature in management sciences, it argues very heavily that the compositions of teams it significantly affects both the organizational performance and the individual uh, involved individual's well-being. And some scholars even argue that organizations should think first about the question of who to put together before even thinking about the question of what the team should do. So in other words, this is kind of an issue about matchmaking or social matching. In, in the context of work life. It's kind of building a, like a Tinder for professionals. And as a matter of fact, there are numerous of this kind of Tinder for uh, professionals kind of applications, such as that one on, on the right, on the slide. But I, I actually find these rather problematic. Anyway, the kind of social matching or this kind of social matching is very, very common when you think about it in, in work life. It is what happens in recruitment, headhunting, uh, while forming teams or work pairs, uh, while doing networking, uh, when establishing new companies, when seeking for new mentors, and so on and so forth. And the key issue here is that many of the choices that we make in social matching are typically quite suboptimal, and they are rather are arbitrary. So our decisions, they tend to be driven by biased intuitions and opportunism. So this makes the decisions quite prone to problematic behavioral biases. One example of a bias is so-called homophily, which means the preference of interacting and networking with uh, like-minded others, or with people who have a have similar background or maybe similar physical features as yourself. If you think about the professional events like this, I mean, those who are there present, and, and you consider when you kind of last picked somebody in the crowd to go to talk to, based on what criteria did you actually make that decision? So, so how could you ever know who is the best professional match based on the appearance or, or the name tag alone. But then again, if we are biased, delegating the set decisions to algorithms or computers is not good either. So a great body of literature criticizes various algorithmic approaches and the automa automation of decision making in general, and for a good reason. We have recently done the same in this context and in, in the paper I mentioned up there. And typically the case is that the algorithmic approaches to matching people are based on kind of maximizing similarity between individuals and on, on the idea of predi predicting new ties based on how we people have traditionally formed ties. A typical example is recommending friends of a friend. And following such kind of logics, they will only reinforce the human biases that I just mentioned. So instead of having very homogeneous groups, the modern work life calls for diversity and many forms of diversity in the compositions of work groups and in organizations in general. Uh, research in management sciences argues very well that we all would benefit from more heterogeneous 
social networks. And I can personally strongly relate to this, especially now after having seen mainly the same faces in the endless Teams and Zoom meetings for the last one and a half years. All right. So on, on this topic, I don't have such kind of easy design examples to show as, as in the previous topic, but I could just briefly talk about one line of investigation. So a couple of years ago, we were thinking about the people recommender systems in Twitter and other kind of social media services. So what I mean are these mechanisms that provide recommendations about who to add as a friend or who to follow, like on the example on the left. And as said before, the algorithms tend to be good at reinforcing and kind of mimicking our humans' traditional ways of networking, but they are very limited in introducing new surprising connections. And at the same time, another topic that we have studied in this area is social serendipity. Social serendipity refers to this kind of surprising, unexpected connections that, however, over time turn out to be very, very, very be beneficial or delightful. So we, we have kind of designed some new algorithmic approaches to seek for more serendipitous new ties in the context of Twitter following recommendations. Now, I'm afraid that explaining the logic in detail would take too long for this talk, and, and also our paper is still under review. <laughs> so I could just simply wrap up this topic with a general call for rethinking that what are the goals and what are the principles that such people recommender systems should follow? So what kind of new social ties would work life really benefit from? And finally, let's introduce the last theme of my talk. So this issue is something we've been working on most recently, and it's about uncivil communication online. So in social media research, a, a very persistent and tricky question is that how can text-based and, and asynchronous interaction serve as a channel for building bridges and kind of supporting mutual understanding rather than further separating different groups from each other. Uh, so we have specifically looked into the communication behavior in the context of news commenting online, uh, where unfortunately one can encounter these kind of examples like on this slide. So this kind of uncivil comments in a journalistic context it's harmful to not only the newsreaders, but also the journalists and the moderators, and they can even harm the publisher's brand. So therefore, in, in our speculative design work, we have focused on new user interface mechanisms that could maybe support more civil tones of the communication. And we've designed a variety of mechanisms for basically explicating and visualizing the emotional tone of or in the comments. This example here is based on so-called affect labeling, which in psychology has been found as a very promising mechanism to support uh, the regulation of emotions by making the person more aware of the various emotional connotations in, in text, for example. Uh, and here, as a perhaps somewhat funny example, here's a very simple visualization of an animated dog that, that very visibly reacts to, the, to certain emotional tones on a, in, a, in a comment while it's being written. Uh, so technically, this, this would require very advanced natural language processing, which is, of course, easier said than done. But, but the main point here is really to think at what could be the simple yet effective ways of making the user to stop and reconsider what they are writing. So what kind of nudges for behavioral change could there be on a user interface of this kind of a commenting platform? Here's another example, and this is the last example of the very same idea of affect labeling. In this case, the design is meant to kind of remind the writer about the diversity of people who might read the comment, as well as to remind about the, the plurality of reactions that the audience might have. Uh, 
this kind of underlines the similarities between public speaking and commenting online, as well as the need to regulate one's self-presentation in these uh, arenas. Again, here, uh, we could think about these kind of ideas also in the context of education. So perhaps something like this could be used when asking students to give textual feedback to each other, for example, in doing peer reviewing activities, or for younger students, perhaps something like this could also help them to learn to recognize one's own feelings and, and maybe learn to recognize the tone of writing while, while experiencing uh, different kind of moods. And as for the next steps in this re research, we have, I mean, already created tens of this kind of design variations, and we are currently building some of these into prototypes. Unfortunately, at, at this stage, I don't really have, a, have an idea of what kind of mechanisms exactly would work the best, if, if any. <laughs> But we are anyway eager to study people's experiences of how using this would, would feel and, and work in practice. Okay, now to conclude and think about the, all the examples together, what, what, what can we actually take away from these somewhat maybe crazy and unorthodox ideas? I think the key function here is, uh, of presenting this is to, to shed light on, on some of the systemic, or the systemic nature of such social technologies, as well as to provoke thought. And this could then gradually make us all more mindful about the different sides of the technologies that we built. So I'm calling for a kind of responsibility and action from ourselves as users, from the technology developing com communities, companies, educators and the society as a whole and finally i want to remind that there's of course a lot of great uh, research beyond what i presented here by many many other researchers so if you're interested uh, feel free to ask for further resources and links i will happily provide provide those with this let me conclude the talk and thanks for your attention i would be happy to take Take questions if we still have time for that. Thanks, 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 thanks. Now we have the echo problem again, I'm, I'm afraid. Take yourself for a second on your end. And is it still here? Oh, the echo is gone. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Thomas. Um, uh, yes, for the presentation. We have exactly two minutes left um, to answer some questions. So I'll read out the question, then you can unmute yourself and just quickly answer and then mute yourself again, and I'll read out the next one. Um, so just to let you know, that I, I, don't, I don't have the, the session open in, in my browser, so the echo is coming from somewhere else than my, my end. No worries. Um, so, um, Jan asks, I really like the shared social media use, like the co-photography or the second monitor on the back. That was just a comment. Now the question, okay, what now do I users hear say? You at all, I'm afraid. Oh, okay. Um, Thomas can't hear me. Do we have a quick fix for that? I'm afraid well, I not. think we are all used to these kind of technical issues now in the <laughs> modern era. <laughs> okay. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, now I can hear Yes, 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 and then yes, we yes, have yes, an echo on my end. And can I speak? Okay. So unfortunately, Thomas, I'm so sorry we couldn't solve the problem here. Um, and we're also running out of time for Q&A, so I'm very sorry for the questions asked in the chat. It still happens. I'm afraid that even in five years, it will still be a problem here and there. Um, conferencing is just such a complex topic, um, and we're just at the beginning of it as humanity as a whole. So. Um, Thanks for your patience and bearing with us, um, Thomas. We'll have to skip the Q&A. Thanks for sharing us today, and uh, see you back in 15 minutes. <laughs>